Ladies and gentlemen, it seems I was a little previous. Please have a seat. <laughs> This gives you the opportunity for the people who didn't turn off their cell phone to put it on silent. Please remain standing for the playing of the national anthem of St. Lucia. <laughs> Please be seated. Your Excellency Cyril Errol Charles, Acting Governor General of St. Lucia, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank and Prime Minister of St. Lucia, the Honorable Philip J. Pierre, Premier of the Virgin Islands, the Honorable Natalia Wheatley, Deputy Premier of the Turks and Caicos Islands, the Honorable Irvin Saunders, Distinguished Speaker of the 23rd William G. Damas Memorial Lecture, Mr. Simon Steele, Ms. Alison Damas, daughter of the late William G. Damas, Dr. Hygienus Jean Leon, President, Caribbean Development Bank, and Ms. Brenda Thomas, Ministers of the Cabinet of St. Lucia, 
members of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank, members of the director, directors of the Caribbean Development Bank, specially invited guests, management and staff of the Caribbean Development Bank, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening and welcome to the 23rd William G. Damas Memorial Lecture hosted by the Caribbean Development Bank. I'm your host, Joel Ford, communication specialist in the office of the president at the Caribbean Development Bank. This evening's lecture is held in honor of the late William G. Damas, second president of the Caribbean Development Bank, noted regionalist, scholar, and economist. This event is a highlight on the bank's annual calendar and represents the best intellectual discourse available both regionally and internationally. Over the years, the spirit of William DeMasse's scholarship has been upheld by distinguished lecturers who have been all committed to economic development and other subjects critical to the advancement of solutions to the development challenges of the region. And this year is no exception. Tonight, the William G. DeMasse Memorial Lecture will be delivered by Mr. Simon Steele, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and a noted son of the region. Mr. Steele has taken his passion for the development of his people to the highest global stages, and the topic tonight reflects just that. Entitled Bridges, Solutions, and Paths, a Caribbean Landscape, we are sure to be given food for thought and for action. But before we get to the keynote address, I invite Mr. Isaac Solomon, Vice President of Operations at CDB, to deliver the welcome and opening remarks. Isaac? Your Excellency Cyril Errol Charles, Acting Governor General of St. Lucia, Chairman, Governors, Directors, and Specially Invited Guests, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the Caribbean Development Bank's 23rd William G. Dimas Memorial Lecture. I extend a special welcome to our guest speaker this evening, Mr. Simon Steele, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change UNFCCC. Being a son of Grenadian soil, I am sure you will not mind me declaring you also a son of our Caribbean soil. In our, in your, our view, your recent appointment to the post of Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC is not just a small step forward for Grenada, Cariacou, and Petit Martinique but a giant step forward for all small island developing states who are on the front line of the climate crisis, a crisis not of their own making. The name William Demas is synonymous with Caribbean development and regionalism, a fact well illustrated by his indefatigable service to the Caribbean community. Not only was he at the vanguard of mapping the path of its evolution, but he undoubtedly set the stage for our survival into the 21st century and beyond, a survival now in doubt. His seminal thesis in 1965, that economic development and the achievement of self-sustained growth could not be considered in isolation from the size of the country, could very well have been crafted in 2023, with the additional variable of vulnerability to the existen existential threat posed by the climate crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, we must leverage the legacy of Dimas <clears throat> sorry, to successfully navigate the climate crisis and ultimately achieve resilient prosperity. This navigation requires access to adequate and affordable financing for mit mitigation and adaptation, and importantly, requires us in this region to act collectively. As an instrument of the so-called regional experiment, CDB is well aware of the pivotal role it plays in global advocacy, mobilizing finance, and developing partnerships to ensure that our citizens can thrive. As we look forward to Mr. Steele's address entitled Bridges, Solution, and Paths, a Caribbean Landscape, I implore us to recommit to working together and speaking with one voice for the preservation 
of our way of life. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Solomon, for those remarks. I now invite Ms. Alison Damas, daughter of William G. Damas, to share with us some reflections on the life and work of her father. Acting Governor General of St. Lucia, His Excellency Cyril Errol Charles, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank, and Prime Minister of St. Lucia, the Honorable Philip J. Pear, members of the Cabinet of St. Lucia, members of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank, members of the Board of Directors of the Caribbean Development Bank, Dr. Hygienus Jean Leon, President of the Caribbean Development Bank, and Ms. Brenda Thomas. Specially invited guests, members of the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I feel very honored tonight on behalf of my mother and I to be able to share with you some personal reflections on the life of my father, William Dimas. As we all know, he was a vociferous advocate of Caribbean integration. And in fact, he had a vision, I am told, by his lone surviving sibling, my aunt Joan, that at age 14, he wrote an article, a letter to the editor, in fact, which was published in the Trinidad Guardian, in which he outlined his vision of a united West Indies. And bear in mind, this was long before West Indian Federation was even conceived. And one thing I really admire about Daddy is that he practiced what he preached. And how did you do that? Well, he started by integrating with my mother, Dr. Norma Dimas of Jamaica. <laughs> And he was described by my husband's uncle, Selby Wilson, who was once Minister of Finance of Trinidad and Tobago, as the only Caribbean politician who never entered politics. Indeed, he did not care what side of the political aisle you were on. So whether you were Hugh Shearer or Michael Manley of Jamaica, George Charles, or John Compton of St. Lucia, Dr. Chaddy Jagan, or Forbes Burnham of Guyana. For him, it was important that he was able to convince them and persuade them of his cause. And it's remarkable that the respect they had for him, and I think that has to do with the power of his intellect and his deep commitment to the cause of Caribbean integration. His crowning achievement was no doubt in 1973, almost 50 years ago, at the age of only 43, when he played a very instrumental and pivotal role in getting the then leaders of our region to agree to the signing of the Treaty of Shagaramas on July 4th, 1973. And in his lobbying, he was successfully able to get them to agree to the establishment of CARICOM and that the Secretariat be headquartered in Georgetown, Guyana. That took a lot of lobbying. Daddy never really cared about material things. In fact, I can safely say that his head was in the clouds 
long before cloud technology came into existence. As this picture will convey, he loved to wear, he didn't really care about appearances, so he wore what was comfortable, his trademark short sleeve shirt jack suit. He was once chided by a former Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, the late Arthur N. R. Robinson, for lacking sartorial elegance. He didn't mind, he continued to wear his short sleeve shirt jacks. I think one anecdote which I'll share with you really captures the fact that he really didn't care about materials things. So apparently the CDB's uh, finance uh, department once had difficulty in reconciling their accounts. And there was a surplus that they could not account for. Eventually discovered that the surplus was due to the fact that daddy had not drawn his paychecks for about two to three months. What was he like as a friend, Willie the friend? Well, his celebrated friend, the late Sir Alistair McIntyre, who we affectionately call Mac, and testimony to this friendship, very deep friendship, is the fact that in Uncle Mac's last book that was published a few years before he passed away, The Caribbean and the Wider World, he dedicated it to Daddy, who he described as a stalwart Caribbean scholar and public servant. He was my colleague and very good friend. And in that book, he describes their first meeting. It was in London. At the time, Daddy was working with the West Indies Trade Commission, which was headed by another great St. Lucian, Sir Garnet Gordon. And when they met at the Trade Commissioner's office, and I quote, we started chatting and had a marathon session that lasted over six hours. That session went beyond trade problems to encompass a virtual review and assessment of the development problems in the region as a whole. And I guess it's for that reason that you at Williams, who is pictured in this photo with Daddy and Uncle Mac, his back is towards the camera, as them being intellectual twins. But in fact, they weren't twins. In fact, they were, they were triplets. And who was the third member of that trio? Sir Sridath Sunny Ramphal, who Daddy had met in Guyana. At the time, Uncle Sunny was the Attorney General of Guyana, and Daddy was at CARICOM. And it is remarkable how the three of them you know, thought alike and all of them were focused really on deepening and widening Caribbean integration. Another great friend was the late Lloyd Best, who knew Daddy from secondary school at Queens Royal College in Port of Spain, as well as at University of Cambridge. They were together at McGill University in Montreal and at UWI. And this is how Uncle Lloyd described them in a beautiful, beautifully written obituary. Quote, he was a wonderful person to know, a raconteur, a wit, an encyclopedia when it came to the zeppo, as well as the facts, current or ancient. What was he like as a husband? I asked my mom, you know, what was the attract attraction to daddy? Because they are polar opposites. And she said it was his mind, that intriguing and deep intellect that she found so stimulating and refreshing. And, why there, and perhaps I think their marriage gives credence, credence to the notion that opposites do attract. Daddy was not 
notoriously unpunctual, unpunctual, mommy always on time. For daddy, Monday could fall on a Friday. For mommy, everything had to be well planned and organized. Daddy's appearance was often quite disheveled. Mommy, as we say in Trinidad, was always, quote unquote, well put together. And of course, as we see in this wedding photo, 1958, there is the nine inch difference in height. But she is in fact the wing that was beneath his wings. She sacrificed what could have been a lucrative medical career to follow him all over from McGill in Montreal, back to Trinidad, to Guyana, to Barbados, back to Trinidad, to Jamaica, and back to his final resting place in Jamaica. That indeed is what you call love. Finally, lots of people ask me, what was it like having such a father? So daddy was not the type of person to display affection. And in fact, certainly, as a young child, I often missed his presence at school plays, piano recitals, swim meets. But later on, I began to realize that his love was indeed deep and strong. And most importantly, he instilled in me my strong sense of Caribbean identity. He inculcated the values of hard work and integrity and the importance of having purpose and focus in your life. He also educated me, and I don't mean you know, paying for my primary and tertiary educa education, but he educated me every single day. One of my favorite memories, I was about five or six with my childhood best friend, and we were jumping on his king size bed while he quizzed us on the capital cities of the Caribbean. And the more answers we got correct, the faster he encouraged us to jump on his bed. Until mommy came in and said, William, what are you doing? The children are going to break the bed. <laughs> he also loved to dramatize history lessons, uh, whether he telling me about Sir Winston Churchill, Che Guevara and the Cuban Revolution, just wide ranging topics. He spoke fluently in Spanish and French, uh, even though as a young child, I really didn't understand those languages. And he loved music. Many a Sunday morning, I would wake up to Handel's Messiah. And he also loved Calypso. Mighty Sparrow was definitely his favorite. And I have fun memories of listening with him to Obia Wedding. Unfortunately, Daddy was, I should say, our daughter Aisha was only eight months old when Daddy passed away. So in her eyes, Grandpa Willie is a legend. This tall and posing figure who she describes as a genius. And she says, that she's convinced that she hears Grandpa's Willie's voice guiding her, advising and counseling her, and also protecting her. And I do believe that Aisha is correct. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alison Damas, for those insightful and I must say emotional comments. You really made William G. Damas come alive, not just in our knowledge of him, but also in our hearts. Thank you once again. Ms. Anne-Marie Warner is the Deputy Director of Corporate Strategy at the Bank, and she will now introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Simon Steele. Anne-Marie?
Your Excellency, Cyril Errol Charles, Acting Governor General of St. Lucia, Chairman, Governors, Directors, and specially invited guests. Recently appointed Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Mr. Simon Steele is a Grenadian by birth who has served his country with distinction. Following an illustrious career in the private sector, spanning the technology and telecommunications industries, he spent nearly a decade in public service, managing several ministerial portfolios. Prior to joining UNFCCC, he served as Grenada's first Minister of Climate Resilience, the Environment, Forestry, Fisheries, and Disaster Risk Management. During this time, he led the implementation of Grenada's climate change policy and its national adaptation plan. Deeply concerned about the deleterious effects of climate change on his home country and the rest of the Caribbean, Mr. Steele campaigned feverishly ahead of COP26, identifying it as a make or break moment for small island developing states and imploring the international community to act. I think all of us in the Caribbean felt it when he told Sky News, I want more for my people. I want more for myself than just to survive. We need to be able to thrive. Undoubtedly, this is a conviction and energy that he has taken into the critical role he has now assumed. Mr. Steele is a trained engineer and holds a Master of Business Administration from the University of Westminster in the United Kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the distinct honor of welcoming Mr. Simon Steele to the stage to deliver the 23rd William G. DeMass Lecture. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie, and I just want to, before I get into the main presentation, uh, just say what a wonderful tribute, Alison, that was to your, your father, a great Caribbean man, a legend, as you said, a thought leader, a father, husband, and clearly he still lives on um, all around us. And in making my address, I wish I could follow in Gene's footsteps in his opening um, this morning where he delivered uh, those opening remarks in Patois. I would have liked to have been able to do that. The only Patois I know would not even be suitable to be spoken in a fish market. So I will not, I will not embarrass myself there. So, Your Excellency, Cyril, Errol Charles, Acting Governor General of St. Lucia, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank, and Prime Minister of St. Lucia, the Honorable Philip J. Pierre, members of the Cabinet of St. Lucia, members of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank, members of the Board of the Directors of the Caribbean Development Bank, Dr. Hygienist Jean Leon, my good friend, President of the Caribbean Development Bank, and Mrs. Brenda Thomas. Specially invited guests, members of the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a very warm good evening. It is truly an honor for me to be here today, and it's great, a great pleasure to be back in our Caribbean neighborhood. And this meeting comes at an opportune moment from the perspective of the climate calendar, sandwiched between June's intercessional negotiations and the Paris Summit on Finance. Just a few days ago, we concluded negotiations in the intercessional, where there was 
fraught discussion, fraught negotiations, tensions, that with the adequate financing that will be discussed in Paris in a few days' time, the Paris summit, with adequate means of implementation, many of those tensions would disappear. So today, I hope to fill the shoes of others that have gone before me by marrying my understanding of our Caribbean neighborhood with the perspective that I am afforded from my current position in UN climate change. As I was preparing my remarks for this memorial lecture, I imagined asking Mr. Damas for his advice. What would he be thinking about the challenges of the day? I can promise you his thoughts would be vastly wiser than mine, but today I want to share with you a vision, a vision of our region and its impact on the world's drive to tackle the climate crisis, the forefront of the how. Our Caribbean region is perfectly placed to provide a bridge between divided international communities, incubate solutions, and chart a path forward which others could crowd in behind. As you all know, Mr. Damas was renowned for being a strong and passionate advocate for the Caribbean integration movement. He saw that as a region, when the Caribbean united, it was stronger. As a brilliant economist, he understood the central role of finance in determining the options available, providing the freedom to choose one's own path towards a just and prosperous society. As I imagined him sharing his advice, I realized that his work is now more important than ever, and the themes he cultivated are as relevant for our time of post-pandemic climate change and geopolitical turbulence as they were when he guided the Caribbean 50 years ago. The Caribbean region was one of the front runners pushing for inclusion of the 1.5 degrees Celsius target in the Paris Agreement of 2015. Those negotiating on our behalf knew all too well that 1.5 wasn't just a commitment, it was a lifeline. And it would require them to be agents of extraordinary change to deliver it. Despite a litany of hurdles, we succeeded. As the science now tells us, the dramatic difference in negative consequences of a world two degrees warmer rather than 1.5, the fact that we managed to secure this ambition to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius means we may have changed the whole world for the better as a result. 1.5 is not only inscribed as a stretch commitment in the Paris Agreement, it's enshrined into actions across the entire global economy. As I stand here in front of you today, nearly eight years have passed since the world came together around the Paris Agreement. Two things have become clear. First, implementation of the agreement is progressing, but secondly, more slowly than is required. Currently, 149 countries now have net zero targets, as do 145 states and regions. 252 cities now have net zero targets, and 929 publicly listed companies also have net zero targets. The direction of travel is as clear as day and becoming more robust all the time. National government net zero targets underpinned by legislation or policy documents have increased in the past two and a half years from less than 10% to 75%. There is no smart CEO in the world today who is not thinking about climate as it relates to their business strategy, their products, their customers, and other stakeholders. The Paris Agreement has transformed the world 
to be far different than it would have been without it. Of course, the global COVID pandemic and the war in Ukraine have not helped in this regard. The effects of climate change have shown themselves earlier than most people expected and more devastatingly um, in consequences. Despite all the pleasures, collectively, we're far behind in our actions to cut emissions on time. In the Caribbean in particular, we face the challenges of pledged support and promises going unfulfilled. High debt burdens, low fiscal space, extreme vulnerability to external shocks, and low economies of scale, to name only a few. We also know that nearly $6 trillion is needed across all sectors in developing countries by 2050 to meet our climate commitments. We couldn't have greater clarity from the scientists that the scale of the problem is enormous and that there is a cavernous gap between what actions are needed and our political, regulatory and societal response. Into that gap fall the lives and livelihoods of hundreds of millions of people, entire ecosystems, cultural traditions, hopes and dreams. It is a gap of suffering, deep and profound, at the cost of in inaction and delay. Yet our scientists are telling us that reaching the 1.5 degrees Celsius ambition is still possible but the window of opportunity is narrowing quickly. This is where I see my work marrying up with the vision of Mr. Damas. The climate and development agendas have gone hand in hand in this region for decades, perhaps by other titles, but the understanding here is ingrained. Friends, what we need now is a dash of the practical Caribbean how. In just a few months, the world's governments and civil society groups will convene in Dubai for COP28 to take stock of how we've done since Paris, the first official global stock take, to chart a course from there to 2030 that will put us onto the track we need and to Im the embedded transformation of the finance agenda to make the course correction possible. At this global stock take, we cannot afford weak or disparate approaches. At the end of this week, many of us here will travel together to Paris for an event which is slated to focus on restoring fiscal space, fostering private sector development, encouraging investment into green infrastructure, and mobilizing innovative finance. Now that's a lot for one meeting. Whatever comes from the event itself, from the climate and development perspective, we need two things. One, more finance available this year. And two, a roadmap for unlocking significantly more finance between now and the end of the decade. This brings me to the vision of what our Caribbean region is uniquely placed to bring, bridging solutions and a pathway forward. So bridging. At school, we're all taught an eye for an eye makes the whole world go blind. But unfortunately, this is where we find ourselves in our drive for collective progress on climate action, a chicken and egg situation, if you will. There are countries within the negotiating arena who see it as their role to hold up progress in negotiations and refuse to take action at home until sufficient finance is delivered to support it. There are others who refuse to provide all the finance promised until they see meaningful action is being taken elsewhere. Here's the thing. Action has to be taken, and it has to be taken by all now. 
To take action, you need finance as an enabler. So both of these things have to happen, and they both have to happen right now. As I said in my closing speech in the June intersessional negotiations in Bonn at the end of last week, climate change is not, is not a North versus South issue. But we need a proactive bridge between the two, voices which can champion a progressive third way a third way which delivers for those that need it most. That means action and provision of support to enable further action in an upwards, iterative spiral. Voices which hold space for sensible and progressive action. Progressive alliances tend to be issue-specific, finding it easier to build common ground around one issue. May that be mitigation action or the importance of certain ecosystems. We need to build common ground across issues, a package of action which will ultimately deliver for all of us. In the Caribbean, we're uniquely placed to understand what this needs to look like, having experienced climate impacts for generations, consistently responding to change by building our communities around principles of growth, global in integration and sustainability with one eye constantly on self-sufficiency. With our limited resources, we know the struggle of what it takes to keep the lights on, our cupboards filled, our children educated, and opportunities for resilience building taken. We are practical people. We can provide the bridges between approaches which provides the space for more ambition on all issues globally. Speaking of which, it was small island development, developing states under the leadership of Antigua and Barbuda as AOSIS chair, which helped land the definitive outcome of a fund and funding arrangements for loss and damage a disagreement which had plagued the negotiations for years. We'll continue to need our region's leadership to bridge between factions and deliver th that fund this year with the support of the Transitional Committee, building the necessary political will for success. Now to finding solutions. The next unique selling point of our region in tackling the global challenge is our size. Where creating economies of scale may have been on Mr. Damas's mind when he proposed de deeper integration and regionalism, a relatively small size is possibly an opportunity in the climate context. It can be positively exploited to enable an accelerated transition to be fleet of foot to be a first mover. As a region, we punch above our weight when it comes to world-changing ideas. Just take Prime Minister Motley's recent drive to make the regional financial architecture fit for purpose. The Bridgetown Initiative is, att is attempting nothing less than finding a way to provide emergency liquidity expand multilateral lending to governments by $1 trillion, and activate in private sector savings for climate mitigation and fund reconstruction after a climate disaster through new multilateral mechanisms. That's all a tall order, but delivery starts with putting one foot in front of the other, biting off sections a mouthful at a time. The Caribbean is, to a large extent, still dependent on fossil fuels for its energy supply. But no one wants to be beholden to the international price of oil and gas. Solar and wind are cheaper than ever before. They make more money and pay back far faster than fossil fuels. Energy production globally is shifting from a concentrated, expensive, polluting, commodity-based system to an efficient, manufactured, 
technology-driven system that offers continuously falling costs and is available everywhere. The world will add a record 440 gigawatts of new renewable capacity this year, double what the International Energy Agency predicted in 2020. For the first time this year, renewables are eaten into the energy market share. Solar is attracting more capital than oil. We cannot end fossil fuel use overnight, but we need to put a plan in place for its accelerated replacement by renewables. Globally, a rapid but phased and responsible transition away from fossil fuels will bring a raft of benefits to populations and societies. National governments and non-governmental organizations are already piloting and implementing new financial instruments and other financial products to support more effective mitigation, adaptation, and responses to loss and damage. Take the example of the blue bonds Barbados and Belize have already invested in. These effective instruments in which expensive debt is swapped with debt at a much lower coupon result in reduced public debt. They ensure precious coastlines that protect the region from climate impacts, that benefits the region's economies and its people's well-being are set aside to be conserved. Ecuador, not far from here, has just swapped $1.6 billion in bonds for a new $656 million um, dollar loan in the biggest debt for nature swap in history, but it won't be the biggest for long. And there is no better positioned region than the Caribbean, along with other small island developing states, to further pioneer innovative financing approaches for managing the climate crisis and buffering against further loss and damage. Meanwhile, regional risk pools and insurance providers are already considering opportunities to offer new products and increase accessibility to their services. The Caribbean Climate Risk and Insurance Facility provides insurance for Caribbean and Central American governments the fisheries and utilities in their short-term recovery from climate impacts. And look at Jamaica's innovative uh, uh, catastrophe bond, which secured $185 million of disaster insurance protection with the assistance of the World Bank and the IBRD Capital at Risk Notes program. This type of financing can help ensure the region isn't completely economically devastated when the next big hurricane hits, but rather is better prepared and more resilient. We are providing the test cases for other small island developing states and regions to build from. We must use our scale as an advantage to explore ideas and, dare, dare I say it, fail fast. We will not meet the scale of the challenge we currently face without testing options and testing them at pace. Now, I am aware that this is not the normal message to give to a room of prudent bankers, but I'm not here to provide reassurance. I'm here to provide the warning of what will happen if we do not lean in. My message to multilaterals and international financial institutions is how important it is to shift our focus from just de-risking projects to de-risking sectoral level finance to better enable the necessary investment flows into the region at far greater scale. We know better than most the inherent bias that can exist in international systems. Those systems that don't understand investing in developing countries. Those that consider it to be more difficult than it really is. Bias doesn't just change through education alone. It also changes through demonstration. This is my plea to you to document and share what you're doing. Don't be quiet 
about either your successes or your failures. This requires a new approach by the international financial community, the difference between the real and perceived risk costs. With a competitive cost of capital that enables the levels of investment flows required to support the region's transition and development. We simply don't have time not to. So now to chart in a path. You only need to listen into conversations between our youth on the block or those who frequent our rum shops here in the Caribbean to quickly realize how we can cut through the noise and get straight to the point. The international multi multilateral system needs clear voices which can unravel confusion and chart a way forward. I want to give you a very sim simple but powerful example of this. There is a person in this room who attended the climate negotiations in Glasgow, COP26. Through their engagement in those meetings, relationships they developed with the presidency, working in cooperation with others in the region and other SIDS, they made the difference on whether the call for special drawing rights was included in the COP decision, further tipping the international community into action. That person is your very own bank president, Gene. So I personally vouch for the effectiveness of all of his travels. At the recent spring meetings, I found myself looking around a room full of eminent persons, and I noticed something interesting. I noticed a clear convergence of language in the room around the global financial architecture, both identifying the problem and what's needed to be done to fix it. That is a distinct positive shift from where we were even a year ago. But the next thing I noticed was the problem. Each person pointing fingers at each other to start, rather than pointing fingers at themselves. That approach may eventually get us to where we need to, but I can't guarantee you it will be, it will be in time. More than grand statements, we need people to roll up their sleeves. We need people willing to sit together in a room for as long as it takes to figure out the how. How we're going to get from point A to point B. This is my call to you, to give a particular focus to your work with shareholders, to support their engagement and active delivery in this space. Globalization has brought many positives, but we should not accept a total homogenization of ideas or approaches. Our culture in the Caribbean has always been value in seeing value in more than money. And today we have the opportunity to lean into that, further developing our thoughts, feelings and perspectives on what makes or gives something value. Where we value our security and resilience, Vulnerability can be assessed in a number of ways. Building a collective vision of accepted ways to judge value gives us the opportunity to be better measure progress from each of our context-specific baselines. The region can chart a path by testing and incorporating these approaches without having to wait on others who might be wedded to the more traditional methods. It will take courage and creativity to unite and to break through the obstacles in our way. But our region has the character of spirit required. With the beauty of nature ever present on our islands, with the joy and resilience of humanity so self-evident in its people, the Caribbean is the region that can make the difference now in this moment of consequence. It's done it before, 
and it can do it again. Today, you are the ones at the heart of that story. The way forward is yours to design. So build bridges, find solutions, and chart the path forward. I thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please give, join me in giving Mr. Steele a warm, rousing round of applause. <laughs> the thing I loved about his lecture that was he put it in words that all of us could understand and that we could all understand the urgency of this cause if we want to preserve this Caribbean land that we all love so much. Mr. Steele, once again, thank you. Yeah. We want to have a brief Q&A question and answer, and I'm going to make the segment a little easy for everyone. I ask you to keep your questions brief. I'm going to ask the production team to please place two microphone stands, one on this side and one on this side. Ah, I see them at the back there. And I'm going to ask you to go to the microphone. Don't start to speak until you get there. Ask your question. We're live streaming the event. So we want our online audience to hear the question in its entirety. I ask that you state your question first and then give one or two sentences to help us understand the context. Once again, please keep it brief. So. I expected that there would be people rushing to the microphones. What is this? Don't make me ask the first question. It's uh, all so easy and so clear. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> You've left them nothing to ask. Well, if I know there's one person who's going to have a question in this room, it is going to be the president. So I'm going to ask a political question. You're going to get me into trouble. <laughs> I think we've all agreed 1.5 to stay alive is the minimum that we have to do. I think we've all agreed at 1.1, 1.2, we are already leaving what 1.5 is likely to look like. And we all agreed that in spite of the fact that we all see how urgent it is and why we need to advance the cause, there are many among us that still believe that is going to come from outside. And so my question for you is, how do we get the region to start on their own, do what they can, and seek for assistance in what they cannot do. How, how do we approach that? Okay, thank you, Jean. Well, the first thing is the science is very clear in terms of where 1.5 um, sits, and the need for that global effort um, to ensure that temperature rise stays within that. In terms of what the region can do, the global emissions from small island developing states is a fraction of a percentage point. So our contribution is low, but the impacts that, um, that we feel, and there is something barreling this way across the Atlantic as, as, as I speak, the impacts are well felt. 
As I outlined um, in, in, in my presentation, I think the opportunity for the Caribbean to be an exemplar as to what can be done um, exists. We certainly have the moral imperative. And that moral imperative is at least heard on the international stage. The piece that is missing are the resources and the assistance that is required to enable us to do the things that we need to do to mitigate, but as I said, the contribution there is, is limited in terms of global emissions. But in terms of being an exemplar in terms of how we can adapt to changing climatic conditions, how we can build resilience. And again, as I outlined, in terms of achieving economies of scale, combining our voices, combining our efforts, combining our intellect, our creativity, our resourcefulness, in terms of putting those, uh, those requests forward in terms of um, the international support to supplement what, um, what we have here within the region. Finance, we know, is the biggest single challenge. Technology is there, know-how is there. The solutions are there. What is missing are adequate resources to enable us to deliver, certainly those within developing countries. But I think that there is an opportunity right now. I spoke of the convergence in language within the international financial institutions in terms of recognizing the need to overhaul the international um, financial architecture so that it can better deliver um, where it is needed. And I believe that there is a unique opportunity that has been presented, but it requires your voices to be heard. And Prime Minister Motley has been leading the way there but more voices can be added to that, and that opportunity exists and exists now. Thank you very much, Mr. Steele. Any more brave souls gonna come to the mic? Aha, see, it just takes one. Yes, please. Behind you? There you go. Thank you very much. And Simon, my question is very simple. We all left Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt at COP, um, Boyd, small island developing states, particularly those of the Caribbean, by the decision to establish the loss and damage fund. And I remember we had a meeting with you on the margins of COP, and we implored you to do whatever is necessary within your powers to ensure that the loss and damage fund does not become another GCF, where it is extremely bureaucratic and difficult to access monies for adaptation and mitigation. What can you tell us as Caribbean tonight that is happening on the eve of COP Dubai to a later phase of those of us in the Caribbean who work in the climate change sector as it relates to the loss and damage fund? Oh, well, thank you. Well, the mechanism that was set up coming out of Sharm El Sheikh was the establishment of what's called a transitional committee with representation from all of the, um, the global regional um, uh, groups. And they've been tasked with coming up with concrete recommendations that will be presented in Dubai at the end of this year as to what um, will be required and what decisions need to be made in establishing um, both the fund and the funding arrangements. We're now halfway through uh, those uh, committee sessions. And that has been supported, um, significant support from the UNFCCC Secretariat the establishment of a technical support unit to be able to provide the technical um, expertise, 
both synthesizing what, is, what already exists, um, so we don't reinvent the, the wheel, but what gaps exist and what needs to be filled, what needs to be, um, to, to, to be bridged. And this technical support unit is from across the development, um, the, the, the development arena. So we're providing the best technical support which will enable the decision making um, of the, um, within the, the, the transitional committee. So where we are now, um, a framework in terms of what the governance structure should or could look like um, has been established. But that is only the wire frame. There is still a lot more that needs, um, that needs to be done. There are two more um, uh, sessions that will be held between now and Dubai. So the jury is out um, in terms of what recommendations will be put forward. But what I can say, and I've participated in, um, in one of these sessions, the parties, whether from the Global North or Global South, are engaging constructively and are working with, um, with intent and commitment. So we will see what the rest of the year brings. But what can still be done external um, to this, uh, uh, the, the committee and the technical discussions that's taken place is the, the political engagement especially from developing countries who will benefit from the establishment of this fund and arrangements, and to ensure that those political messages are heard by those who have capacity to provide support for um, the operationalization of these, uh, these loss and damage mechanisms. Thank you for that. We'll take one more question. And just um, want to ask, um, today the president, uh, Dr. Jean Leon, uh, mentioned the, the important, the crucial role of private sector in development. I would like to ask you, um, how to attract private sector for the cause of the reduction 1.5 and in general for the climate change uh, objective. Thank you. Okay, well there are a couple of things that immediately spring to mind. It is understood that in terms of public finance resources to achieve, what is it, the six trillion dollars um, of investment that's required and um, between now and 2050 in the developing um, world that public funds alone will not be enough. So there's been a lot of discussion about how public funds, the limited public funds, can leverage and attract um, the private capital um, that is needed. So the most obvious area, and there are areas such as the energy transition where there are very clear business cases. Um, there are revenue generating opportunities. The ability to build business cases that are able to attract um, private sector capital um, is there. But every country, every region isn't at the same starting point. And I spoke about the cost of capital. And where you have the cost of capital for developing countries many, many times, six to 15 times more expensive than in developed countries, there's clearly work that needs to be done there in terms of reassessing you know, what is perceived risk and what is real risk and how to, um, how to address that. And then the second thing, and it speaks to, again, the de-risking is what um, the multilaterals can do, what public funds can, um, how they can be used in order, so whether it's first loss, um, but to de-risk um, projects and programs that can make it more attractive for private investment to come in. And then there is 
the whole suite of blended finance. So mixing, um, whether it's grant concessional um, uh, funding with that of private funding um, for, for projects. The greatest issue on the mitigation side, as I said, there are established business models that make it more attractive and easier um, for investment. It's adaptation um, where the challenge is in terms of identifying bankable um, projects and much work is still needed there. Within the UNFCCC process, one of the work programs is the global goal on adaptation, which is developing a framework the same way there are clear metrics um, which lend themselves to um, quantifying investment flows um, on the mitigation side um, in terms of quantifiable targets. The global goal on adaptation is to use the same thinking but applying it in the adaptation space which again should facilitate greater um, uh, investment uh, visibility and in terms of attracting the investment that is, is required there, both public and private. Thank you very much, Mr. Steele. Ladies and gentlemen, please, let's put our hands together for another big round of applause. Bigger than that, bigger, larger, yeah for our keynote speaker, Mr. Simon Steele, the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I now invite Mrs. Diana Wilson-Patrick, the General Secretary and Bank Secretary of CDB, to give the vote of thanks. Diana. His Excellency, Cyril Elrell Charles, Acting Governor General, St. Lucia, Chairman, Governors, Directors, and Specially Invited Guests. My task tonight is a simple but very important one, and that is to express our gratitude to those who have made this event a success. I start by thanking Mr. Isaac Solomon, Vice President Operations, CDB, for his keen opening remarks, and Miss Alison DeMas for the heartfelt reflections on the life and work of her father, William G. DeMas, the second president of the Caribbean Development Bank and the person who inspires us each year to great things. I also extend thanks to Miss Anne Marie Warner, Deputy Director of Corporate Strategy at the bank, for introducing our guest speaker. And so to our main event, a special, very special thank you to Mr. Simon Steele, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, for delivering the 23rd William G. DeMas Memorial Lecture. The title, Bridges, Solutions and Paths, A Caribbean Landscape, was a mystery to me when I heard it, but Simon really made it come alive. The attendant subject matter was timely and intuitive, dovetailing as it does with the bank's own initiatives and the directions for development in the region and of course the urgent need to access affordable financing. Thank you to Sandals Grand Resort for hosting us and working with our team to make this event and other activities surrounding the bank's annual meeting a success. Thank you to the video production team for working with the bank staff to ensure that this event is live streamed to our audiences on the various platforms. This event would not have been possible without the event planning team at the bank. It's not easy pulling off a week-long series of events and dealing with the myriad of things that go wrong. We know all about that. But tonight, you've done the bank proud, and we salute you. All that is left is for me to thank you, our audience, whether here in beautiful St. Lucia or online, for your attention and presence. An event such as this cannot be successful without a curious and engaged audience. We appreciate the participation of those who were brave enough to pose questions and probe this evening's topic. 
and we certainly look forward to having you join us for the 24th William G. DeMas Lecture in Canada in 2024. Wishing you all a very good night. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of this 23rd William G. DeMas Memorial Lecture. Thank you for joining us for this special event. We invite you to join us for some light refreshments, but before that, I ask that you stand to allow the Acting Governor General to leave us. The ushers will show those of you the way. If you cannot join us for some light refreshments, please travel safely. Good night, everyone. <laughs>